Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Great to see you all. So many wonderful faces. Yeah, yeah it's a good week. Yeah. It's a good week. I feel like a couple, a few weekends back, it was Easter weekend. I, I think we were a little thin on attendance. Totally understandable. But, and also, we didn't, you know, the illustrious Nick Gravani is here today. So you're drawing a crowd, you know. Those are your words, not mine. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just hanging out, enjoying myself, and it's a nice, nice, cool shirt. So cool. Maybe, I have an illustrious shirt anyway, that's for sure. Yeah, seeing some fun folks in here. Steve Brady's joining us today. Welcome Steve, to, all right. Good to see you, Steve, out there on the West Coast. Jeannie Grassi's here. Good to see you. Chris Jeannie Brown, Jeannie. Phil Bondi. Awesome. Right. Nick Lassard up there from Canada. Carl Very Lee. cool. Good stuff. All right. Well, uh, we're, we're, we're live now and we started, a, you know, maybe 60 to 90 seconds late. So I'll jump into it. I'll give a little bit of intro uh, for anybody that's new to this and give a little intro to Nick and we'll get started and get the chat running. So welcome. This is Piano Tech Radio Hour. This is the program that's being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more about that at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And today we have a guest on Radio Hour. We have guests, very interesting people from the piano industry. Um, Nick Cravan combines Cravania combines a formal engineering background with over 40 years of hands-on experience in piano design, manufacturing, and rebuilding. He has authored numerous articles for the piano trade and has been a featured instructor at piano technical seminars all over the U.S. His business currently revolves around rebuilding and manufacturing custom sound boards for the piano rebuilding trade. So it's really great to see you and have you back here, Nick. We had you for the convention a few weeks back, so yeah, loving it. Yeah. That was good. That was good. Good to be there. Good to see yeah. everybody today. Yeah. And uh, in their busy lives, taking an hour out. Um, I love the format. I think this is one of the greatest things going right now. Um, it's casual. Relaxed, it's a cat. It's a casual it's thing that attracts a serious yeah, crowd, so which, which I think is pretty cool. A casual thing that attracts a serious crowd. Okay. <laughs> so. So we can so, talk about anything uh, you want today. I noticed that um, in one of your emails, Ethan, you had said it would be uh, voicing centric. Uh, it doesn't have to be that. Yeah, if people have I'm, questions, I'm ready to talk yeah. about anything, uh, you know, and all things, because I've done a lot in, in every aspect of this business, fortunately, and uh, and I've enjoyed. It. I've learned a lot. I've rubbed elbows uh, with a lot of great people in our trade. Um, this is not a singular uh, deal, you know. I mean, those of us who have been in this for several decades can remember in the past where work was hidden. I worked for one music store where a grand action had been pulled out of a, of a Steinway piano and a, and, a, and a big moving blanket had been thrown over the top because the technician that was working there, who was, a, you know, the store technician, didn't want me to see what was going on. And those are the dark ages. And uh, things have been open source for a long, long time now. That's definitely beginning in the 80s, but definitely late 80s through the 90s. The, the um, you know, really blew the lid off things with the, with the journal articles and uh, a lot of teaching. Uh, and also what happened at Steinway when they started to bring in people like Eric Shandal, Kevin Stock, uh, Kent Webb, who's there now, um, Scott, Scott Jones. You know, these people working for Steinway were from us. They were from the trenches. And so when they started giving classes out there, it also uh, became much more open source. So 
uh, you know, that's the track we've been on for a long time, and I'm glad to have been a part of it and continue to be part of it, as many of you who are viewing it right now uh, are also in that, uh, in that track. So, yeah. where do you want to begin, Ethan? Well, actually, one thing that was coming up for me is um, curious if you want to share about what your experience with the convention that we did was. Like, how did that go for you? How did you... Um, like the the format, the audience, um, any highlights for you? Um, yeah. Well, it went great. I mean, I enjoyed every minute of it, and I watched all the classes, uh, which was you know my privilege to be able to do. Being one of the instructors, we got access to everything, and uh, you know I just thought it was I thought it was great. I don't know what I can add to that other than uh, you know at your end. You have the logistics, you have the feedback, you have a lot of different things going on in your end that, that inform you as to you know how it went and how you're interpreting the, the results. But uh, you know, as a format, I thought it was great. Um, I like the fact that you know it was like one class after another. There was no no competition, where it often happens. You know, at uh, uh, live conventions where people have to decide. Oh, I really want to see. So and so, but it conflicts with that. Well, I guess I'm going to have to make a couple of hard choices here. Uh, that's not the case, you know, with that kind of format. So, you know, other than that, I, I, I look forward to more of them and to be in, you know, more, more of them upcoming. So. Yeah, that always stresses me out about conventions and, you know, group get gatherings because I'm, I'm, I'm much kind of more of an extemporaneous personality type. So I kind of show up and, let things lead me where they lead me. And, you know, what that tends to turn out as at a convention is uh, I kind of lose out actually, because you kind of got to plan ahead and you got to see what the lectures are that you'll want to go to. And then you, yeah. you really got to logistically. Being a, wind is, is, yeah, being a feather in the wind is not always the, no, no. the best way. I mean, the, the, the catalogs too, they come with little, little bubbles so you can check off your stuff in advance, Steve. And I don't know if you ever noticed that, but <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Trust you me. Know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like a personality type kind of thing, but you know, what I end up doing, what I end up getting out of can it. You? Yeah. We can hear you, David. How's it going? Did you have something to chime in with David? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, no, but one thing I do get out of it is, is, um, you know, I meet interesting people and, you know, in, in the hallways and, and, and have interesting conversations with people that I run into, uh, you know, Norbert Abel or something, you know, sitting, sitting in the hallway between sessions and just sit down and have a chat about the piano industry. And... Uh, well, I just want to tell everybody that I'm talking now. Okay, go ahead, David. Did you want to cut in and say something? Well, just I want to tell everybody that I'm having deep internet problems. Yeah. My wife is on the phone with a provider right now. We're going to try to reboot the system. So I'm really sorry having these issues. But I'm curious if we can, you know, at, like at this point, we have a little bit of a critical mass of um, like a bit of a gang here, you know, like so if anybody's having like if you're having trouble with the internet provider, maybe we could all gang up and, you know, make them pay. You know, get get something to happen. Make some. <laughs> it's can we, can we it's, get Nick's volume up? Um, Is we, my volume not good enough. We tried a little bit. If you just move, are you? If you're using your computer audio, Nick, you could just scoot in this. a little bit. If I do that, if I do that, does that help? No. How about no. now? No, it's about the same. No change. No change. No change. Mm -hmm. But I bet if you just move a little bit closer to the computer, we'll we'll grab it a little bit louder. You might not be able to rock us. I can speak. Us. I can speak louder too. Um, does that help? It does a little bit. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. it's all right. And Ethan, if you can turn yours down a little bit. Oh yeah, totally. I'll back up from the mic and I'll kind of whisper. So I've... let's get into some stuff here. What do you want? What do you, you know, there was voicing stuff. There's. Uh... <laughs> Soundboard stuff. There's all kinds of stuff we can talk about here that um, I'd like to get into. Yeah, you were you were talking to me a little bit uh, before the session about how you and your wife had worked together doing some rebuilding things, and uh, yeah, I'm just curious about interesting things that 
uh, you've arrived at having worked on soundboards and, and doing rebuilding um, tweaks or discoveries or turning points for you that people might be interested to hear about? Well, um, you know, having made, you know, 470 soundboards now, most of them Steinway, from all the different eras of time. In fact, I've got one from 1880 uh, in a shop now. You pick up a real sense of what was sort of standard. In other words, what were the things that made them the same and what were the things that made them different? And decades ago, it, you know, I would, I would have two soundboards in the shop, either, you know, I was bellying the piano there or, and or one was sent to me in a box. And the serial now, let's say there's Steinway B's, the serial numbers might have been only 150, you know, units apart. And yet, on one, the thickness in the middle of the board was maybe um, 350 thousandths. And on the other one, it was 325 thousandths. Um, the ribs, another big thing. Uh, I count the ribs from the base from the bottom of the tail of the piano up as number one, two, and up in the treble would be 11, 12, and 13, whatever. The depth of the ribs was not uniform. Some were much taller than others. Uh, the, the thinning pattern was never the same. I shouldn't say never, but often not identical. Some are much thinner going around the curve and into the tail of the piano than others. And all of these things had an impact on the tone because the more mass and the more bulk there is in the soundboard, the more impedance there is. Now, impedance simply means does the soundboard readily move, that the strings readily move the soundboard. The bulkier it is, the, the strings have more difficulty in moving the soundboard. And so there's what we call feedback. The string vibrations reach the bridge and then they get fed back to the string and the string says, I don't want them. I want you to have them soundboard. The soundboard says, I don't want them either. You take them back. So that fight between the string and the soundboard system goes on and that's what we call sustain. So the bulkier it is, the more sustain you're gonna get, but not necessarily power because power and sustain is a zero sum game. As sustain goes up, power output goes down and as power output goes up, sustain goes down. But the, a nice mix of the two is really, really makes the best soundboard. So we had to ask ourselves, where do we wanna go with this? Because obviously we don't necessarily wanna copy something that looks bulky um, on the other hand, we want to necessarily copy something that looks like it's too, uh, that the impedance is too low. That would be a very thin soundboard with very shallow ribs, which would be happy to receive the impulse from the string, but it bangs it right through, just like a cowbell or a snare drum, uh, big power outburst, but no follow through. So all of those things, you know, we had to figure out where do we want to go with this? And, you know, we came up with what we believe is the, is the happy medium that gives both a good power spectrum and also a good, good follow through on, on the sound of the tone. Uh, and so that's something that we've had to work with as we've gone through the years. And we're not the only ones, you know, that have had a look at that, but uh, we've had our own personal journey uh, on that. We think we've reached, and, and according to our customers and, and uh, universities and other, uh, you know, end users of our product have been extremely happy. So obviously we've, we've hit on that. So, Thanks for uh, the I'm other gonna, thing too about just to interrupt you on that because maybe there's yeah, something deeper question. to. I'm just curious. I, I'm not sure if they talk about this kind of relationship in the Reblets, um, which was you know had been the sort of traditional kind of bible yeah, of piano very, information. Very, um, it was transformative in its day and still is. Yeah, I, I remember reading uh, Mario Egrek's book and sort of learning yeah. about some of the things that you're talking about. Um, yeah you know, just sustain and impedance and how all those things work right. together. Can you talk, maybe if you know about it, if you can talk about it, if you don't, that's fine. Like the evolution of, you know, at least even for you understanding of these things. I mean, you're, you're an engineering background, but I think, you know, a lot of piano technicians might have been absent of some of the, you know, technical understanding of these things, maybe working on intuition. Do you have a sense of the evolution of how that information sort of 
became more widespread or less widespread or how you sort of started to think in those terms? Well, yeah, it, it, the, the, you know, what it forms is pretty disparate, but I can start with at least one, one aspect of this. And that is my son, uh, uh, is a college professor in, in electrical engineering. And the idea of power out um, and dwell, which exists in you know, electronics and electricity, and it's some of the foundational thing, reactance is really the, the main word to it. So you have energy flow in electricity, which is called current, and you have reactants and you have the um, other, other items and components that go into a system that, that restrict the flow. And so the whole idea of power and what they call dwell in, you know, in electronic electric circuits more so um, uh, is, is re really evident. And so they can show this on all sorts of little gizmos and oscilloscopes and, and power output thingies. And it's no, it's no uh, secret that these things work in, you know, in opposite directions. When, when the flow is high, there's a lot of power output. Reactance is low. And when the flow is being constricted through various capacitors and different things, the, the, the output is less. Uh, so there's no power, but there's a lot of buildup. There's a lot of sustain and dwell going on in the system elsewhere. So that's one of the things that informed me. The other thing was just having measured and looked at so many soundboards, it's obvious that nobody is making a soundboard that's a quarter of an inch thick all the way through or a half inch thick all the way through, or it's making ribs that are only a quarter inch tall or making ribs that are two inches tall. So, so as many different boards as I saw over time, it became obvious that, that there are certain, certain parameters that, uh, that obviously exist. And, and about 350 thousandths of an inch uh, in the middle of the soundboard and tapering off into the curve to about uh, 320, sometimes 300, even as low as, as 280 thousandths, uh, is something that you see over and over and over again. So to make a decision as to where I thought I wanted to sort of nail this thing uh, midway, wasn't that difficult by just looking at a lot of the averages, you know, that would exist. And I began, you know, working through these things by buying old upright pianos and, and cutting my teeth on knocking them out and uh, making the panels and, you know, figuring out what sort of presses that I would, I wanted to use. Um, and, you know, moving it forward in that direction, also uh, carbon bridges, right? I started out with softwood, a decent softwood, you know, not, not stuff that's too grainy. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, then moving on to the maple. Now in an upright piano, you know, you really can't see if the job isn't really as cosmetically beautiful as you want it to be. But you learn pretty quick, you know, by just working through those things. And then by the time I felt I could uh, uh, graduate to a grand piano, it was a Mason and Hamlin double A, I think it was. And, you know, the thing is that this particular soundboard wasn't all that bad, but um, I knew it needed one for, for a variety of reasons. It was uh, more or less flat. There were tonal considerations. And when I took the piano up on its side, and uh, I had already had the pin block out of this particular Mason and Hamlin. I actually used that pin block to ram this piano, this soundboard out. And I remember the first time I picked up that pin block and I hit the rib on the bottom and I heard a big crack and crunch and all the other stuff that I'm used to hearing from having worked on uprights. There was no turning back. This was, <laughs> mm. this was it, it was do or die. And so, uh, and, and it turned out good. So, you know, everybody was happy, but uh, those are the things that inform me, just the experience, looking at everything that I've seen, working with the uprights, uh, having a technical, uh, you know, scientific basis on how to think about the whole thing in the first place uh, was also a part of it. Now, downbearing adds to the impedance. A soundboard all by itself has um, a resonant frequency of its own. And if you, uh, if you either activate it with a sound source from underneath, um, it comes in at around 100 hertz or so. It's pretty low, 
And as down bearing increases the, the pressure on the board, the, uh, that impedance starts to, starts to increase. Now, again, impedance is important. We've got to have it. And it comes from two sources. It comes from the actual bulk of the system and also from the fact that uh, some rims are more massive, like the Mason and Hamlin rim. You know, and the whole system is very massive. And uh, uh, so we have mass in the board itself. We have mass in the rim and other places in the beams. Um, and so, uh, you know, that taking into consideration, we increase that with, with down bearing. So that raises the, uh, the impedance. So we get it from two places. We get it from actually stressing the board through down bearing and also from the mass and its distribution. Now, um, it's, the soundboard is supposed to be a spring. And the typical model for, you know, how soundboards work comes from this idea of a compressed spring. Now, when you compress even a coil spring, just think of the spring in a, in a, a damper return, for example. Uh, as a spring is compressed, energy is introduced into it. As the spring is relaxed, the energy is out. Uh, an analog to this is that we know that a hammer, you know, can't can't be made well unless it's stressed over the molding. So it's no secret, but it's a good analog is that you know we have a lot of compression on the inside, a lot of tension on the outside. So this hammer would be useless if there, and that energy is in there. By the way, once that spring is, you know, that's in there, that stays there until the hammer dies or, you know, becomes way too old or gets, uh, you know, filed a, a thousand times. But basically, that energy stays in there. And it's the same thing in a piano string. A piano string is useless sitting on your, your workbench. The only time it has anything going for it is when it's stressed. And when you stress it, you put strain energy into it. So strain energy and potential energy goes into the string when we stress it. It goes into the hammer when we press it. And it goes into the soundboard when we compress it with bearing. So all of these things adding together show that you know, energy is going to be released and tapped. It's trapped as potential energy, but it has to be released and tapped and will be once the system is activated. So, so I'm going to, it's a big subject. I'm going to, I'm going to come on this few questions. Yeah, no, I think it's really useful to just kind of hear you uh, go off on this and think and know the things that you think about. Um, Nick Lassard asks, string mating process would be great to discuss. Um, any general things to, to throw out there? String mating process? Uh, string mating. So, you know, so I'm, I'm well, guessing the, the, mating really the, the hammers to the strings. To is, you know, that, that it uses high tensile steel. And the, the whole evolution of the piano from the harpsichord to the forte piano to what we have now, everything that's happened has basically followed along the course of how much tensile strength can we, you know, get out of, out of strength. So as basically the evolution of the piano itself is completely parallel to the evolution of tensile strength that was able to be gotten from, from drawing strings. Uh, the process itself, I mean, I don't know a great deal about it. I've seen videos on it and so forth is, uh, you know, how they draw it through and, and stretch it and so forth and how they have to anneal it and do the different kinds of things they do with steel when it's, uh, when it's processed is a fascinating thing. There might be something like that online. I haven't really, I haven't we really were, Also, just to, you know, just to interject, is used not only just to interject. Yes. I think the question was about the mating process of, of mating the hammers to the oh, strings. Oh, mating, not mating. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Well, that's a, that's a critical process. Um, you know, how we go about that has been a little controversial about whether we use a bubble gauge, whether that really matters, uh, whether leveling the strings themselves even matter, what leveling actually means. Do we really level the strings? Or do we set them in a plane, which is much of my way of thinking, we set them in some sort of a plane with each other. And uh, the point of mating the string is that if the hammer does not hit all three strings at the same time, it's gonna hit one 
or two right before it hits the second or third. In the worst case, it's going to hit all three strings at different times. These are nanoseconds, but they do matter. So the first string, it's like it's like greyhounds, you know, jumping out of a out of, out of the uh, racetrack. If uh, you open three gates at three different times, you know, those those dogs are going to jump out at three different times, and they're going to be galloping down the track. They're not in phase. If they happen to jump out exactly at the same time, then the three dogs are in phase. Now, if they're in phase, uh, the, the three strings are in phase as a hammer hits the three strings, then you're going to get the, the best reinforcement of the tone. Um, you're not going to have one sine wave going and another one following right behind it, because that's going to create um, an out of phase situation. And what we hear in an out of phase situation is a tinkling sound little symbols, you know, going a little buzz, that sort of thing. That's what we'll hear from it. Uh, and, and also the tone will be weaker. So make so and a broad answer to the question, it's a very important thing to do. Now I do level the strings, quote unquote. Uh, now an interesting thing to know about a graphs is when they go in, they go in at an angle. Okay, they do not go straight down into the plate, they, they're tipped backward toward the tuner, right? That means if you were to turn that A graph in a particular direction, the three holes are not going to be at the same level off the soundboard. So this is one of the reasons why uh, setting that A graph so that the strings are really perpendicular coming into it is so important. If it's a little off or sometimes a lot off, automatically those three strings are not going to be level with each other. Now, I use a bubble, and it's frustrating because it falls over. I used to have one with a magnet on the bottom that Richard Davenport made, and I can't find it. But um, at the very least, if you get them in a similar plane, uh, you know, that's a start. If you can get them level, quote unquote, to the sound, to the key bed itself, that seems to make a lot of sense because everything, as, as uh, Chris Brown is, is want to say, Everything has a verticality to it, and we want the caps in the, you know, come up vertical, the whip to come up vertical, the hammer to come up vertical, and the hammer hit the string vertical. And so if that's the case, then obviously the we want the strings to be leveled to that verticality so that we have a perpendicular situation. If we can't really get that, at least they have to be in some sort of line with each other and uh, hopefully not too far off. I mean, if you get them in line with each other and the bubble is still tip a great deal like that, you know, that's odd, that's an odd situation. And you can't really always pull those strings up uh, to get everything working exactly the way you want to. So it's a little of this, a little of that, but that's the ideal model for it. But however you get there, you gotta get, uh, you gotta get your hammers made into the strings. Of course, traveling, Ethan. don't forget traveling is a big thing too. Hey Ethan, it's David. I'm I'm back, and hopefully, hopefully I'm back strong. They they rebooted. Actually, oh, actually, David. Also, I'm not. I, I apologize, folks. It does sound like there's a lot of difference in our audio settings today. But David, you're coming in clean, but kind of loud. So feel free to loud. speak quieter or, uh, okay. or back off the mic a little bit. <laughs> but we can totally hear you. Good to have you back. If, can David Anderson not be loud? That's that's I think the question. Uh, that that that's that's a, that's a intense question. <laughs> okay, you back? Yeah. yeah. I'll 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 chime in with the next question, Nick. I think we got a lot of good info on on string hammer mating. Have you done any? And this is from Carl Lieberman. Have you done any measurements of hammer rebound speed with steam voicing in different areas? of the hammer no no uh i wouldn't say so carl first of all hi carl always good to hear from you um you know you're using the phrase that you saw when i did the, the convention about rebound up you know off, off the string and how important that is uh the footprint that the hammer leaves i mean it's not a physical one it's not a smudge but uh, the footprint uh, on the string is going to be very small if the hammer is hard, and it's going to be very broad if the hammer is very soft. So um, if you, in a broader way, asking me if steam, you know, works on, on taking a recalcitrant hammer and, and making it work better 
It certainly does. I have some experience with that, but most of my, my handiwork has been with new stuff. And, uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been a long time since I've had to try and make something work that was, that was really difficult. So I don't have any experiments. I don't have any quantification for it. In fact, quantifying hammer rebound in the milliseconds that, uh, uh, that we talked about in my, in my convention class is, you know, there's no way to do that. We use our ears to do that. So if the rebound is too quick, you know, like a maple hammer here, I'm gonna hit it on the back of the board here, right? You get that. And if the rebound is a little less quick, you get that. So that's nothing new, but uh, you know by ear if, if it's right. Carl, I hope that answers the question. Steaming works on a difficult hammer. And uh, that's really about all I can say. I can't really quantify it in terms of having made experiments. I'd love to hear from Carl uh, where the question came from. Did you have you done any experiments uh, with that yourself? Uh, no, I haven't done experiments. I, I mean, I do steam, and I do steam in the low shoulders to to make it rebound. I don't usually steam at the crown because it kills the attack. Yeah, and I do it by ear, and especially right. on older hammers, it's a very effective technique. But I just wondered if Nick had actually, because he's, you know, he's a scientist, he does this sort of stuff, so. Yeah, well, I, I, I wish I could. Um, and, you know, hey, there's so much, you know, if PTG had a lab, um, I, I would want to be part of that team that came up with all of the kinds of experiments that we would want to, want to run by. And, uh, you know, that would be one of them right there. Uh, Agraph torque would be another one. You know, there's a lot of torque on a lot of, a lot of there's a lot of torque on the torque. And I have run some experiments on that. And, uh, you know, snugging it up is one thing. How far does it actually go before it snaps? And I have actually done some experiments with that too. And I had some foot pound readings. But for the most part, if you snug those egg wraps up so when they, it comes around, you know, into the area, into, into line to where you want it to be. And, uh, I, it, it, as long as we're on that topic, I would stress all of you stringers out there to keep your egg wraps a little less, a little shy of exactly where they need to be when you're stringing the piano. Uh, and then just before you commit to pulling up the coils, you can actually sight down that egg wrap and see that your strings are coming in perpendicular to that. If it's a little off, you know, you can back off a little bit or come around a little bit, but you want to wait, you know, until you commit to that. Most of the time we're replacing egg wraps. So, you know, that's a, that's a key issue right there. So I, this is just something that interests me about what you just said. And, you know, some of this stuff I found is, it sounds exciting, but maybe it's really difficult to put it together. You, you talked about like a, like a lab, like a piano lab or a research institute. That sounds, oh, really, yeah. I, that I, sounds I, really cool. We got a million ideas on, on what we could do with that. Now I have a question for you. Know, for you one on... thing, I mean, while you go on with your question, before I even forget, yep. uh, one of the things is at what point does a piano key, all by itself, um, begin to cheat through repetition, right? If all if we put just a weight on the back of it, let's say a uh, hundred gram weight on the back by the A graph. I'm sorry, by the capstan. And then have a little paddle wheel, you know, you know, just keep doing that. And then we keep adding key leads to the front of the key and find out at what point it really begins to cheat or slow down. I think that'd be a great thing to know. And to set up an experiment like that is a piece of cake, really. But we need some lab equipment. We need timing uh, uh, diodes and all different kinds of things to be able to read these things. But uh, there's another one right there. We don't have that. Are you familiar? A good thing to know. Are you, Mike? So my question was, I've looked up, you know, having been uh, in, in graduate school and having access to kind of uh, research databases and things like that for free as part of being in a university. Yeah, I've looked up papers on acoustics of pianos and things like that. And it wasn't always clear to me that the same crowd of people that we run into in like the PTG and, you know, clearly, clearly our, our run of the mill, like even myself being a researcher in one area, but going out and tuning pianos on the road 
it's different and it was, you know, I didn't do any research based stuff on pianos, but do you have a sense of like, who's doing the research? Are they connected actually directly with the people who are doing the work on the pianos or do you have a sense of how this all no, is integrated? Generally not. So the, some of the research I've seen uh, involves the highest level of mathematics that you can imagine. Uh, tons of calculus, all kinds of differential equations, a lot of modeling going on. Uh, and by the modeling I'm talking about, not necessarily physically building something, but mathematical models, uh, left and right. I mean, the, the, the internet, I don't know about the internet, but a lot of the papers I've seen, which I found off the internet or were sent to me, uh, we're in, we're in that, uh, in that vein. Uh, you know, the best people to put together on this are those that have something of a scientific background, but also are, are piano people. I mean, these are the people I would want designing a piano, first of all, right. To be able to pull both of these things together. Right. Uh, like there's a fellow, Joachim Leonardi from, yep. uh, Germany. Some of you may know, uh, We've had some discussions, and Michael Springman and I have had some discussions. And uh, you know, he—he's the kind of character that uh, uh, you know he's got both. He's got both, and so you know, those are the things that we need. Those are the kinds of people. They also tune pianos. They've also broken strings. You know, they've also had liars fall off. All the stuff that we, uh, you know, we're the tough people. We're the tough people, right? Anybody, and I don't mean to. I don't mean to disparage anybody, but anybody can sit behind a computer and come up with mathematical models left and right and make it sound like it's really good stuff. And it may be good stuff, but um, we're the trench guys. We're the ones that uh, we're right. down and dirty with this stuff. And so we, what we bring to the table is crucial to those mathematicians. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, maybe we've gotten to the point in history or the future, however you want to look at it, where, uh, maybe there's a way to bring some of these people together just as a group and start speaking about doing a little bit more formal integration of, like we said, the different people who are, you know, people are researching, people are creating, getting them together. I mean, I would get think of Del Fondrick, right? He, he's someone who's kind of got his own little research lab in his basement almost, right? And um, Michael Spreeman, uh, we've talked to... Um, uh, Alex Kirstan, you know, over there in, in, uh, in Europe, they're doing very interesting things and innovating and they're definitely of... doing R and D yeah, and yeah. using, using both the mathematical and the practical. That's the only, the only expert, you know, stuff that I would listen to would be done by people that have both a scientific engineering, mathematical and a practical background because, you know, <laughs> pianos are a different animal than many mathematical models have shown, you know, mm -hmm. they just are. It's, it's a complex phenomenon and to try to parse it all out solely on a mathematical, mathematical model doesn't work. It's like, no. watching subatomic par particles who watches them has a huge determinant over how they act so mm. i have no idea yeah it makes me think of you know the the sort of the the normal distribution and the the sort of bell curve like the traditional bell curve right you, you have a bell curve of responses to any specific thing and the mean of that gives you some information about sort of what what's the average effect of any given thing and i think that for for many years it's been a very useful figure the average like what's the average thing that happens and that's kind of what you get out of models right you get the basics but you don't get the details and what's always interesting about that sort of bell curve is what happens at the outliers like the thing that's not average, what is abnormal is sometimes the most interesting thing. What makes, uh, you know, a piano above average as opposed to average is actually the things that we, that we care about. Um, so yeah, I well, totally agree with that. You know, it, yeah. Now, you know, Fazioli, they are great at this kind of thing, but it's proprietary. 
Uh, the information well, that's the that, problem. Yeah, the information they give out, well, they have a right to, you know, to keep some of their secrets. I, I, I get that. But um, the, the real problem, see, now even the book, The Acoustics of the Piano, I think it's five physicists or so. This book came out some decades ago. Right. I loved it instantly. But I also understood the, the technicalities in there. My thrust in everything I've done was to try and bring that to a level that we could understand. Not everybody's going to read that book and get much from it, uh, other than in you know broad general strokes. But to, but to sort of boil it down and say, okay, what is actually useful in this book that I can explain to my fellow piano tuners out there? Uh, many of which are wonderful tuners and great mechanics and do everything that needs to be done. But once they see a mathematical equation, they just, it's gone. That's right. So, so to bring what that equation has to the, to the public uh, and only, only what's necessary from it and then to explain it from, you know, from, a, from my point of view as a piano person has always been the thrust of what I've done. So anything we would do that would be lab based, uh, you know, would have to have that as its final outcome. What is the simplest message we can get from a complicated set, set of uh, experiments we might have made? Um, you know, talking about voicing too, I mean, we run into a, there are natural obstacles to evenness of voicing. You know, to take one hammer and voice it on a, in a piano. We, you know, we go through the usual thing. We'll say, okay, this hammer's too dense. It's too hard. And we need to do this, this, and this, and this, this, and this. And we're going to listen again. And we're going to find that, okay, the fundamental's stronger. And the, uh, the uh, harmonic overtone series is not now grating where it was before. But it's not quite there. So we're going to do a little bit more, a little bit more. And we're going to listen again. Okay, the mechanics of that are not that difficult. Uh, and, and even first time practitioners will, will find that, okay, it made a difference, I hear that. The real trick is how do you make them all sound the same? And it's too easy to say, well, I got a crummy set of hammers because I can't make them sound all the same. <clears throat> what we're missing is that the, the piano is working against you in this regard, because if you're working on note, whatever it is, and, and the, the gauge is 15, uh, it's a gauge 15 hammer, a, a string rather. And then the next note right up is 14 and a half. It's shorter. It's less stiff than, than the string you were just working on, because let's say that the, the uh, tension went from the, 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 the 15 gauge a string tension might have been 165 pounds of pull. Now you're at the 14 and a half, the first change you've made, and the string tension is not 165, it's 154. I mean, that's a pretty big drop, but in a bad piano, you would find that. In a better piano, it might go from 165 to 159. All right, that might seem like a lot, but that's a more flexible string. So that's going to react differently than the one you were just on. But you're right. saying to yourself, how do I get this, this hammer to sound like that one? You're using the same techniques, but something's not happening. So there's many things in the piano, not to mention the, the impedance that's going on in various parts of the piano. Roger Jolly was fond of saying, I can always tell a crummy soundboard by playing the notes and I'll hear bang, 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 because the ribs underneath of a particular part of the scale as a lot of impedance right underneath that note. <clears throat> Excuse me if I'm a little, little hoarse here or something. And uh, so, you know, there are many things that, uh, that are working against us in that regard. So we need to give ourselves a break for one thing. Yeah, I realize that, okay. Go ahead, David. Well, I couldn't agree more. The thing is, when I listen to some of my favorite recordings in the world, mm -hmm. And then I listen to the recordings I've made over the years on pianos that that I've prepared. I, you know, I, my intensely powerful big ears, they sound great. And I'm, 
I'm just a country ass voicer. I'm just a rock and roll player that mm -hmm. whose ears led me through failures and to get to be pretty good. You know, I totally from my feeling, from my inner being, I don't even know what you would say, but I know that I can get very close to having all the notes sound or give the illusion of sounding really good. Same, equal, beautiful, yeah. you know, I can yeah. do that. And I know a lot of other people can too, that when they see a mathematical model or a chart with all these numbers and pointers and stuff, they just go, uh, you know, well, while you, while you people were in school with slide rules and calculators, I was on stage writing tunes and here was my responsibilities, writing tunes and showing up for the gig. You know, I... <laughs> They say well, there's, so, they say there's four. Uh, they say there's to the table. We yeah. do. And I'm in awe. And I really tr work hard at understanding some of the more cerebral aspects of piano technology. Mm -hmm. And I think that's beautiful. I think it's a wonderful challenge for me to be with somebody like Nick, who has a whole other world of background. Uh, to look at and see and experience pianos than I do. I think it's, I think it's a huge gift. Mm -hmm. I was going to say there's four, they say there's four stages of learning. The first stage uh, you call unconscious incompetence. It means you don't know what you're doing, but you also have no idea how bad you, you are. Uh, yeah. the, the next stage is conscious incompetence. You yeah, have learned enough to know that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Then the next stage is conscious competence, meaning you've learned about how to do it, but it's a very conscious process. You have right. to kind of have some effort around it. And then the final stage is uh, unconscious competence, meaning you're so good at it that you actually don't have to think about it. And it's useful to remember that the ultimate goal of all the learning is the unconscious competence part right. of it you know no matter how you get there whether you have to spend some time getting technical uh with the numbers or you know out of experience the ultimate goal of everything is hopefully the unconscious competence um so i question the use of unconscious in that final stage i would say supremely conscious but not thinking about it yeah it, it's i would say your awareness is totally in the job. When I'm really doing my best work, I'm in the zone. My awareness is in the job, but I'm not sitting there listening to all the both self-critiquing and, you know, oh my God, what about this? And what about this? And trying to think my way through it. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, what do you call it? A semantic discussion of yeah. how you want to think of the word That's uh, right. unconscious. But it, the, what it reminds me of is uh, the difference between implicit and explicit. Like something that's explicit, it's usually very tangible. You're like working with it directly. And the implicit yeah. is a little bit more yeah. uh, sub, uh, it, it's, I would, it's beyond those voices that you have. That's there. exactly right. I would call it instinctual mm -hmm. confidence or primal confidence, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know, something like that. Love it. Let me get to at least a couple more of these questions. We've we got about 10 minutes left here. Uh, uh, thank you all for adding your questions and apologize if we don't get to all of them. Uh, had a good one and is related to maybe some of the things we said. Larry Lobel said, Nick, can you think of some persistent piano myths that you've come across? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Persistent and piano myth. Myths? Myths, myths about pianos how untrue function, yeah. maybe as as technicians you know things that you see people think is the way right way of thinking about it but they've, they've got it flipped upside down or something well that's a weird question i'll let it simmer let me go to the next one. yeah uh <laughs> no I, I haven't really thought about that my, on my own very much if you could give me uh a clue 
Well, how, does anybody else answer that? Like yeah, a let myth, me, a piano myth. Let uh, me go to the next lay one. people or, or piano or technicians or both? Both, I let see. Me, yeah, let me hit the next one and we'll let it simmer for a second. So the next one is about choosing hammer weights here. Let's see what it was. It was, can you talk about how to determine an optimal hammer weight from a tonal perspective? Yeah, in, in broad question. strokes anyway, it has to do with the, the belly system. I mean, everything has to be coordinated in, in, in piano design and piano manufacture <clears throat> and in, uh, in remanufacture too. The uh, a lightweight belly, and by that I mean it has, you know, lower impedance. It's a thin soundboard, and you know Steinway's thinning patterns go back many, many decades. Not just, not just in the celebrated uh, so-called um, diaphragmatic soundboard from the mid 1930s, which was introduced into their smallest piano, the Steinway S which uh, we don't see very much in the building shops, uh, or I don't think very much anyway out there. But the original M's, L's, and O's, which are in the same category, they're the lightweight Steinways that don't have the, uh, the collector system where all the beams come into that saddle, right? Which is a wonderful system. But the S, M, L's, and O's do not have uh, that. They all have the horn that, that comes down, that little notch you'll see in the belly rail. <clears throat> all had serious uh, thinning patterns, even, even back in the, in the vintage years. It's not yeah. all that well known. The difference is that it wasn't all the way around. Now, the diaphragmatic soundboard as it exists today, at least theoretically, uh, is thin everywhere, from the front to the back to the both sides and so forth. Whereas the early fitting patterns were very noticeable along the curve of the piano and into the tail, not so much along the spine and not so much along the belly rail, but definitely it was there. And those boards generally were not thick. Uh, at all. The, the maximum was maybe 350 thousandths or something, but you find them plenty of thinner than that. And ribs likewise, not very, not very tall, although within, within the realm of, of uh, support you know the sample would necessarily collapse which would be a disaster but these systems with lower tensions uh, even and more in the 160 150s you know 160 pounds of pull uh, on the strings um, are easily blasted into orbit with a hard hammer and so you're going to get a real nasty rattling kind of sound uh, from a hammer that's too heavy um, and that's too hard so if you start out with a very, very dense hammer on a panel like that, you've got a lot of work to do to get them down somewhere where, you know, it's musical. And the other thing, too, is that you can take, whether it's a renter, whether it's a novel, whether it's what I call a, a wobble, which is Wally's, Wally Brooks's obbles, and um, uh, the Ronsons, too, you know, the, all of these hammers serve a different purpose. And in every case, if you just take four or five different hammer makers and the same voicer now worked on the same piano with all of those different hammers, let's say you had, you know, five actions, uh, you know, or, or even you could just change these out on shanks and stuff. The best tone that you're going to get from each of those hammers is going to be a different sounding piano. Uh, it would be a good sounding piano, but always a different sounding, different sounding piano. So you have two things going on here because you can't have a heavy hammer on a high action ratio, which opens up a whole, you know, other subject. Uh, so you're going to have to find a hammer that actually works for the action as well. And uh, going with the ratios that we're working with today, which is in the five to one ratio, which will hold uh, virtually all new hammers today as they come to you after you've cut the tails and and arc them and cove them and did side taper and drilled your borehole and so on, uh, will work on that, on that action. Now the old, these old Steinways that I'm talking about from the Vince's years that were the lightweight Steinways, many of them had high action ratios and very light hammers, hammers you can't get today. Super light, light hammers. They are. That's right. Super light hammers. In some cases they were like, uh, where you'd find, say, a seven-gram hammer, 
more or less at the middle of the scale at say 849, you would find something like 5.5. That's right. And you're just not going to get that. So, um, you know, and a broad answer to the question, basically you have to consider if it's a lightweight belly, a medium weight belly, which you find in the bigger A's, certainly in the B's and certainly in the D's, uh, begin thinking about that. Also your customer, I, I still call them customers, I'm old school, has a lot to do with this. I mean, David's point of view that, you know, he seeks to find his inner expression. How do, how do I need this piano to sound? That's wonderful. Um, but it, 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 you got to be careful with that too, to a certain extent, because the customer has also something in mind. And Completely. what exactly is they that they want? You have to consider that too. So it's extremely subjective, and where this is going to go. If they like a darker tone to begin with, they want something you know sweet and mellow, that sort of deal. Uh, and you start, and you're already working with a lighter weight belly, and you pick up a very dense hammer, and you have to voice that down a lot. You know, you could be asking for a, not only a lot of work for yourself, but also possibly a customer that's not completely satisfied. I, In a situation like that, I'm more inclined toward uh, toward a uh, an obel or even a Ronson hammer. But if they're you know power hungry types and they just want to hear a lot of big stuff coming up front, you know that's a different thing. So I hope that answers the question in, in big round uh, big round terms, but usefully. Lots of good information. Well, we're at about two minutes, one and a half left. So I'm glad we didn't have to cut you off on that particular answer. Lots of good information. <laughs> so we'll, it's probably a good time to just start to, to wind things down. So what I'll say is uh, lots of good questions in the chat. Really appreciate uh, people adding them. We had a wonderful time today. Apologize for any little glitches concerning the audio. I'm trying to be a little bit more subtle with my tone here so that <laughs> it matches with Nick's. And, turned and I'm sorry audio. for the, I'm sorry, Ethan. I'm sorry for the glitch at the beginning. My apology. Uh, uh, we rebooted through the provider. And it got better. Nick, we could have you as a regular every month or Something like that. Like, well, I like, hope to be back regularly. I'd like to talk about sauce noodles. I'd like to talk more about, you know, building the soundboards. There's a thousand things that, that we could do in this forum. And I'm, uh, I'm yes. happy to be out there doing that. I'd like to thank everyone who showed up today. Good to see your voices. Many of you I know, and I wish I could say, speak to you uh, personally. But thank you, for, uh, thank you for joining us in our little chat here. Yeah, Absolutely. Sure. Thank yeah. you so much. I'll just remind uh, so everyone, we put some links in the chat there so that you can go uh, visit the website, sign up for various things. You can give us some feedback on this session. And so uh, we appreciate you all being here and we'll catch you next week. All right. Stay okay. safe. Stay safe. Stay grateful. Yeah, be safe. Bye. Bye. Stay Bye. present. Bye, kids. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.